In America, we love products. We're lured by the clever advertisements, and we're suckers for product packaging. The vibrant colors and sexy shapes. And nothing is more important than this smell. I mean, who doesn't sniff a product before buying it? But if you ever wondered what chemicals are used to make your favorite products, keep wondering. Most manufacturers don't want you to know what's actually inside. In Latin, it's called caveat emptor, buyer beware. I'm just trying to find out what kind of chemical they would put on a kid's pajamas. This information is considered proprietary to the company. The chemical used to manufacture many of the products that we use every day are never tested to find out if they're harmful. He was a parent even know that it was in a product you were buying for your child. That's actually the biggest problem of all. My blood contains 175 chemicals linked to cancer. This is a love story. A mystery. The chemicals that are in the environment that are in our everyday products end up in our body. A crime drama. Chemicals are not tested in the lab to ensure they're safe. They are tested on all of us. A wake-up call. In the 1960s, a woman's lifetime risk of breast cancer was about 1 in 20. Today, it's 1 in 8. Look, for those who have cancer, everything that can be done by government. A disease that has touched the life of nearly every American. You're just dumping all this toxic stuff into your bloodstream. And a farce. I take offense when anyone would even insinuate that our industry you know, is supporting an increase in the body burden of chemicals. Where, where do you think we're headed? People think if something's in my shampoo or my toothpaste or my chair, surely someone is making sure it's safe. No one's made sure that it's safe. It's my story. A consumer warning this morning at Justice Store. But it could be yours. Now, this is no taller, but there's a lot more tree here. My wife, Heather, always looked forward to celebrating Christmas. She loved the tradition of it. The lights, the music, the food, and of course, the gifts. And somehow she knew exactly what our girls would want. But now that she's gone, it's all up to me. Except, I'm not really a shopper. So I started looking where any dad would. Online. I thought they'd love the pajamas I ordered from a store called Justice. And they did. until they took them out of the package and smelled them. Hi, you've reached the home office of Jeff. God, this thing stinks. We bring the hottest fashion to life for tween girls, like me. Thank you for calling Justice. This is Devin, how may I help you? Hi, for Christmas, my daughter received a pair of pajamas and when she opened up the package, we were overwhelmed by the synthetic odor. I checked the website, and it doesn't appear that it has this fragrance, and I wasn't quite sure what it was. This is not something that I would be able to handle. Okay. It seemed like a common sense question to ask. I'm just trying to find out what kind of chemical they would put on a kid's pajamas. Okay, I actually can't give out that information. So I kept asking. That's information through our sourcing team, and I don't have that information to provide. So the sourcing team wouldn't want me to know if there was a chemical sprayed on the garment that's manufactured in China and sent to my eight-year-old? I even tried calling the factory in China that made them. Sweet dreams, dreamy soft pajamas. But nobody at Justice seemed to know the answer. Justice understands this demographic very well. It's practically become a lifestyle brand for tweens. Justice is a billion dollar company with a thousand stores in the US. Do you know the company Tween Brands? It's on the New York Stock Exchange. I thought investors might get better customer service. I would like to purchase one share. This information is considered proprietary to the company. Gotcha. Justice for all, you could say. They don't. Hi, 
You've reached the home office of justice. Where we bring the hottest... That's annoying. Then I left a bunch of detailed messages for the CEO. Hello, Mr. Raiden. My name is John Whalen. I am a shareholder of your parent company, and I am now a disappointed customer. But he never called me back. Eventually, I spoke to the head of all products Justice sells. Ronnie Robinson. Hi, Ronnie. This is John Whalen. Oh, hi, John. How are you? Good. How are you? He assured me there was nothing to worry about. Every chemical that we use is, you know, completely tested. And, you know, our average customer is a 10-year-old girl. We make sure that everything we use is, is appropriate. OK. Is there any way to find out what the chemicals are that they use on it? Um, I'm not sure. Even if I ask them that they tell me, because it might be proprietary, so. Okay. Is there any way we can try to find out? Because quite, I mean... It's not, it's not got anything nasty. What, 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 even if they came back and told you, what would that, how would that help you? I'm just curious. It's made overseas. Um, they're using some sort of chemicals. You're not sure exactly which ones they are. I'd like to do my own diligence and find out which ones they're using. I can tell you 100% and I can guarantee that it's safe. But you don't know what it is. How could you tell me it's, you're 100% certain? Because, because we are in full compliance with all the government laws, laws and regulation and our own testing procedure. I guess the only thing I could do is send the product to a laboratory and uh, find out exactly what's in it. I guess you, you bought it. You can do what you want with it. You want apple or pear in your lunch? Apple. Sophie? As the girls and I settled down into our New Year routine, I miss my wife, Heather. Here, take it. Just take it. It's on. It's recording. I remember coming home late one night. She was eight months pregnant, and I heard a strange noise coming from the bathroom. I found her reading the label on every tube and bottle, and then tossing most of the products right in the garbage. At the time, I didn't give it much thought. But now that we're on our own, I understand. Heather was just trying to protect us. Won't you be seated, please? We are here today for the purpose of signing the Cancer Act of 1971. President Richard Nixon started the war on cancer by appointing a prestigious panel of scientists to examine the disease. For those who have cancer, they at least can have the assurance that everything that can be done by government now will be done. Over the next four decades, scientific panels have produced the president's report to identify chemicals that increase Americans' risk of cancer. I see you. Heather died from cancer in 2009. <laughs> the same year, the president's report emphasized that cancer risks due to toxic chemicals were grossly underestimated and that these chemical exposures are devastating American lives. A disease that has touched the life of nearly every American. In the 1960s, a woman's lifetime risk of breast cancer was about one in 20. Today, it's one in eight. That's a dramatic jump. So when you're talking about environmental causes of breast cancer, we're talking about a lifetime of exposures, um, not just, you know, as young women, as, you know, pubescent girls, as school-age girls, as, as toddlers and infants, even in utero. All those chemical exposures affect uh, our lifetime um, health outcomes, including breast cancer. Consumer Product Safety Commission. So I'm wondering, now you guys would regulate children's pajamas? Yes. Okay. So do you have a list of chemicals that a manufacturer would not be allowed to put into a children's pajama or clothing? No, sir. Okay. So from your standpoint, from the agents, the federal agency standpoint, uh, these companies, they, they don't have to tell me what's in it, but they also, they can put whatever they want in it, it sounds like. Um, they don't have to tell you that. It's up to them. We don't have any federal regulations stating that they could or could not. Only the manufacturer can provide that, and or you would have to have the product test. Gotcha. 
Heather tried to avoid buying products with harmful chemicals. And that's all I was trying to do. Justice wouldn't tell me what chemicals were used in the pajamas to make them smell. So they left me with no other choice but to send the PJs to a laboratory for a chemical analysis. One way or another, I was going to find out what makes these pajamas stink. Scent is way more powerful than people in our society understand as a signal to us as consumers, and we are often manipulated by those signals. The reason most cleaning and personal care products don't list all of the details of what's in any of these products is because they don't want you to know what's in there. We've all probably turned the bottle over and read the label, but one big loophole in that labeling law is fragrance. They don't have to list their ingredients. So whether you're holding a perfume, a cologne, shampoo, shaving cream, whatever the product is, normally the fragrance components aren't disclosed. And that can be a mixture of even hundreds of different chemicals hidden in that one ingredient. They're scared of consumers learning that they're purchasing a product that has a toxic or carcinogenic ingredient. They're trying to avoid the consumer backlash that would come if they were transparent. So it could be that that fresh smelling scent is making us sick. A Freedom High School student is rushed to the hospital for emergency treatment. The school's principal says the student suffered an extreme allergic reaction to Axe body spray, a popular body deodorant known for its provocative commercial. Unilever is one of the largest food, beverage, and personal care companies in the world. And its Axe brand is the leader in personal care products for men. Actually, few men use it. But Axe body spray is the leading scent for boys in middle school and high school. The company website claims Axe is the number one scent that helps guys get the girl. I think they see those sexual commercials and they're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get all the ladies using this stuff. And I've talked to a lot of girls in my school. They all say it smells like crap. Brandon Silk is your typical high school freshman, except he doesn't use Axe body spray. If he did, he could die. When I smell Axe, I smell an underlying smell. My body feels like it's basically shutting down, and I pick that out immediately. I have become a bloodhound. Brandon had to quit school after going into anaphylactic shock three times in one week. The third time it happened, my throat was so swollen, you couldn't even fit a straw down my throat, and that scared me completely because I knew I was that close to dying. We tested other sprays on me, but with Axe, it's the only one that's doing this to me. You know, it just goes on and on. Here's his records from Children's Hospital. They had to use uh, an EpiPen on him. I mean, you name it, it's all in here. For over a year now, Brandon's mother, Rosa, has been pleading with Unilever to disclose the fragrance ingredients in Axe so she can protect Brandon from whatever's causing his deadly allergy. Unilever basically said it's really, this is not our problem, in not so many words. It's proprietary, and that's something that they don't have to um, disclose. Now, Brandon's doctor wants to do another test to try and isolate his allergy, but that could send Brandon back to the emergency room. I don't want to have to get rushed I, back to the hospital again. I know, it gets worse every time. I know, but you've been away from it for a little bit now. Let this sink in because I don't know what to do. You know, what ingredient is an ax? Well, I don't know what type of proprietary information could be more important than the, the well-being of a child. I really don't know. But I think if they wanted to really help, I think all the information would have been disclosed. I mean, we're still back at square one and there's still no answer. So I feel your frustration. Can we get off this topic, please? Okay. I'm sweating okay. and I don't want to. All right, give me a hug. Give me a hug. Come because on. Unilever won't disclose the ingredients in ax, the Silk family can't avoid buying products that may contain the same chemicals causing Brandon's allergy. I'm already smelling things. <laughs> yeah, what do you smell? Um, I'm smelling that, and I'm smelling that. Alexandra Zissou 
helps people transition to a healthier lifestyle. This is a fragrance disaster. This gives me hives. Reach under your kitchen sink and take your cleaner or your soap out. Oh, Mr. Clean. Original fresh scent. You may see the word fragrance, so you think that the ingredient is listed. Ooh, appleberry twist scent. But as it turns out, fragrance is made up of a bunch of different chemicals that are um, alarming. Throughout the average American home, almost all consumer products contain fragrance. And the formula is government protected as a trade secret. Double Dutch apple. A apple and lemon peel. Totally twisted wild jerry twist. Brazilian carnival. Wacky melon. Meadows and rain. You're eating fragrance, you're wearing fragrance, you're washing your hands with fragrance again. Women and teen girls typically use up to 20 products a day. Men and boys, Jay, wow. about half that. Oh, that's the girl from the Jersey Shore. And hidden ingredients in these products have been linked to a variety of adverse health issues. Oh my God. You're blowing your nose with fragrance. From asthma and obesity to infertility and cancer. I would just have a giant garbage pail and I would just take all this shit out of here. The sooner you get rid of this in your life, the better. Part of my personal uh, resistance to artificial sense is that my mother growing up was very, I think she has an allergy to some of the chemicals they use in order to disperse them. For certain fragrances, they're really, really strong. And sometimes it get like, you know, it just gets really bad with my nose. So it's like allergies. Why do I wear cologne? Well, besides the fact that, I mean, it's just got these enormous strengths in attracting women. What do, what do you think about guys who wear cologne? It's kind of like actually an indicator that someone's trying too hard. Right. But yeah. It's like a second agenda? Yeah, it's like I spray this on myself and therefore I must get laid. Any idea what's inside fragrance? Alcohol, <laughs> special formulas right. that are created by people in laboratories. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Did you know there's a loophole in the law? So if you see the word fragrance, it appears to be a singular ingredient, but it's actually used in lieu of disclosing, you know, perhaps a hundred different synthetic chemicals. I had no idea. How you doing? Just wondering if you had a second to give us your two cents on what you think of uh, like perfume. And... Oh, like a real perfume or the perfume of Jesus? Fragrance, I would say, is to the nose what music is to the ears. It's exactly the same. Well, wow. Christophe Laudemille designs fragrances not only for people, but for clothes, products, even environments, like the scent used exclusively in Abercrombie and Fitch stores. Here, Laudemille's signature scent is pumped out like music to provide consumers a unique shopping experience. Your nose is as important as your eyes, in fact, and usually it's always more important than your ears. To, uh, to decide, to feel, to remember, to learn. So all that is also influenced by the sense of smell. Modern fragrances like these are made from thousands of chemical ingredients, synthesized in a lab and designed to mimic natural aromas. In perfumery, you can use man-made molecules. You cannot extract the sea. There is no sea extract. Huh? That smells like you're on a boat. You have to recreate that, okay. Some ingredients are so powerful, you dilute them just like a very strong pigment, you dilute it in white paint. So it's the same with ingredients. Some ingredients are extremely powerful. They can smell of uh, sewage. But then if you dilute it, the same ingredient, it will smell of hazelnut. So it shouldn't surprise me that what I smell isn't real lemon or vanilla, but a concoction of chemicals manufactured for industrial distribution, designed to trick me. We have 3,000 raw materials. In, in some way, shape, or form, all 3,000 are on this floor somewhere. The ingredients that you'll find in any fragrance company are relatively the same. There's about 3,000 raw materials, and when perfumers are creating, uh, these are building blocks as raw materials for them. Fragrance ingredients either come from petroleum or plants. A lot of the synthetic chemicals that are used to make these less expensive fragrances are derived from petrochemical feedstocks. And the reason for that is that they're a lot, they're a lot less expensive. We buy the natural chemicals, which are more expensive, of course, but derived from plant materials, from botanicals. Natural fragrance makers often list their ingredients on product labels. But if anyone did want to find out what synthetic chemicals were used in a fragrance, they couldn't. Companies can claim those ingredients as a trade secret. So the sense of smell is very, very secret because the industry kept it as a black box, but also because it's very, very complex to study. 
people are not educated to read formulas and uh, there is no intellectual property coverage or protection. Most fragrance companies couldn't patent their the formulas, so they were recipes. There was a formula vault, it looks like a bank vault. You know, all the formulas are sacrosanct, they're held in that vault. Uh, very few people in the organization were allowed access to them because they're recipes. And you know, it's, it's easy, if someone gets their hands on a formula, to reproduce that. Like the secret formula for Coca-Cola, or the Colonel's recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken. Recent scientific discoveries have added new and entirely different components. Fragrance makers can keep the chemical components in their sense secret. The result? Fragrances never known before. And thus, a great fragrance is born. Today, fragrance is a hundred billion dollar industry and still growing. Whether a scent is promoted as a product feature or sold as a fine perfume, the truth is, most fragrance ingredients don't come from flower fields in France. They come from chemical factories in New Jersey perfume industry has been trying to maintain a mystique uh, because fragrances have always had a certain allure of mystery and romance and creativity about it. And by transforming it into a chemical company with ingredient disclosure, that mystique is, um, is gone. The fragrance industry expressly said that they don't want consumers to know that the ingredients that are in Chanel Number no. 5 are some of the same ingredients that are used in their toilet bowl cleaner. They don't think the consumer is sophisticated enough to be able to make that distinction. There is a lot that goes into making a fragrance, and we get that. We're not asking for that. We're asking for what chemicals are used in our personal care products, what chemicals are used in our cleaning products, so that we can make educated decisions. But trade secrets aren't limited to perfumes, pajamas, and personal care products. Many industries say their ingredients are a trade secret in order to avoid disclosing that their product contains toxic chemicals. If you have an ingredient or a chemical in your product that a consumer can Google and find out that it is toxic or carcinogenic, well, you don't want to have to tell people that that chemical is in there. What's troubling is where these secret chemicals are ending up. According to an independent lab hired by the Environmental Working Group, my blood contains 175 chemicals linked to cancer, 210 chemicals linked to heart disease, and 196 chemicals linked to birth defects. But the most disturbing results of this study revealed all 10 infants tested had almost as many chemicals in their blood as the adults. We tested umbilical cord blood from 10 babies born in the U.S. We tested for more than 300 chemicals. We found 287 chemicals altogether. Everything from consumer product ingredients like Teflon and Scotchgard to flame retardants and fragrances to waste that comes from burning gasoline and garbage. The chemicals that are in the environment that are in our everyday products end up in our body. These chemicals get into the mother's body, slip across the placenta, and contaminate babies even before the moment of birth. And the fact is, each one of us, each of our children, is born pre-polluted with hundreds of different chemicals from our everyday lives, from our everyday products. Of the over 80,000 chemicals circulating in commerce today, of high concern is a family of commonly used chemicals called phthalates found in everything, from fragrances to cosmetics, pesticides to plastics, cleaning supplies and clothing. Phthalates are also members of a longer list of man-made molecules called endocrine disrupting chemicals, or EDCs. Our endocrine system controls mood, growth, metabolism, sexual development, and reproduction, and relies on hormones for normal function. There is a class of chemicals called endocrine disruptors that actually mimic natural components of our systems, uh, hormones in particular. And these chemicals can interfere with the function of those hormones by binding to the same sites in cells where these hormones normally bind and creating havoc if the exposure to those chemicals is happening in a way that interferes with, with the normal processes. Endocrine disruptors are synthetic chemicals that sneak into our bodies through the nose, mouth, and skin. 
and trick our endocrine system into mistaking them for real hormones. When you have a synthetic chemical that is a mimic for a hormone or does something directly to disrupt the activity of one of those signaling naturally occurring chemicals, you have a disruption and that has downstream consequences. The intestines go ahead and take more calories. The pancreas secretes more insulin and the ovaries and testicles that secrete our, our sex hormones are sensitive to disruption uh, by these chemical signals that are mimics for the naturally occurring hormones in our body. Although most of us have never heard of endocrine disrupting chemicals. What do you think that pink stuff is? Chemicals. Why would you say that? The World Health Organization warns that exposure to EDCs represents a global health threat. These chemicals have been introduced into the environment without any careful testing for their potential effects on human health and on children's health especially. EDCs are rarely listed on product labels, so we don't know when we're exposed. And these chemicals are everywhere. The truth is, EDC exposure has been linked to infertility, birth defects, learning disabilities, and cancer. Unfortunately, it gets worse. Endocrine disruptors are proven mutagens, which means they can actually mutate our DNA. What's troubling is that endocrine disrupting chemicals can lead to changes in the chemical signals on the DNA molecules themselves that tell the body to turn off or turn on certain genes. So a child born to a mother that had an endocrine disrupting chemical exposure can have health consequences that have nothing to do with the child's exposure, but relate directly to an endocrine disrupting chemical exposure in the mother. Because product manufacturers can use endocrine disrupting chemicals and keep that a secret from consumers, they will never be responsible for any negative health outcomes in the future. I think she just moved a little. Yeah. We are quietly becoming genetically modified by toxic chemicals. The chemical industry has always wanted to hide information about harm from its products, from the public, but also from government regulators as well. And it's very hard to tease out, once these are in the environment, what's causing our health problems because we're exposed to so many different things. We've been in dialogue with the fragrance industry, with the cosmetics industry, with the cleaning products industry, who are saying we don't want to disclose our ingredients because we don't think there's a problem. And they are looking at their one product or their one chemical and saying it's fine. What they're not doing, they're not looking at the variety of exposures that all of us are exposed to. Chemicals exist in mixtures and it is next to impossible to figure out how two chemicals or three chemicals in that mix are working together in concert to create some type of chemical chaos. The rise in autism, the rise in breast cancer, the rise in reproductive problems, the rise in certain childhood cancers, the increase of diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, all have to be due to environmental factors. And if you map the increase of those diseases against the increased use and exposure to toxic chemicals, there's a pretty good match there. When the chemical analysis arrived for the pajamas I bought from Justice, I was curious whether my instincts were right. Could there be toxic chemicals hidden inside? I called the chemist to decipher the report for me. We looked at things that the EPA considers to be potentially problematic compounds. Okay. In your case, um, there were two phthalates, and of all the phthalates, the one that's the most problematic potentially is this one that's this 2 ethyl hexyl phthalate. These phthalates are endocrine disrupting chemicals and can be especially harmful to young girls, even at minuscule amounts. More, more concerned about it than any other phthalate out there. Hmm. But he also found something even more alarming. Then, uh, in amongst all those, there's compound six. This tri-2-chloroethyl phosphate is in fact a flame retardant called Tris flame retardant. It's listed as a potential carcinogen. 
A form of tris flame retardant was banned for use in children's clothing 30 years ago because it can cause cancer. In America, um, foods, drugs, and pesticides are regulated. You may say they're not well enough regulated, but you really have to provide information because those are the things that go into our mouths. Um, other chemicals like flame retardants are not regulated. There are not really health requirements, but they go into our bodies the same way. Dr. Arlene Bloom is an expert on flame retardant chemicals. Her landmark studies help get one form of the chemical out of kids' sleepwear. Back in the 70s, all baby pajamas were treated with brominated tris. And we found that it was a very strong mutagen. It changed DNA. But industry likes to keep things as similar as they can, so they replaced brominated tris with chlorinated tris. And we ran more studies. It also changed DNA. And uh, chlorinated tris was removed from children's pajamas. Up until the 1970s, most home fires were caused by careless smokers. In response, government regulators asked the tobacco industry to come up with a self-extinguishing cigarette. They did, but there was one problem. It changed the taste. So Big Tobacco went to Big Chemical with a big idea. Why not change the couch and the mattress instead? And the flame retardant industry was born. Manufacturers infused these chemicals in everything, from furniture to electronics and children's products, including pajamas. The truth is, seven billion tons of flame retardants saturate the industrialized world every year. On average, the typical home is doused with four pounds of this stuff. And today, kids have five times more of it in their bodies than their moms. You know, I've heard statements, if even one life is saved, it's worth putting these chemicals in their products. There's a mountain of science showing harm. On the other hand, when you talk to government regulators, they don't know this. Since the president's recent report on carcinogens warned us about the link between chemical exposures and cancer, consumers are faced with a dilemma. On the one hand, the government urges us to avoid chemicals that cause cancer and birth defects. But at the same time, corporations can put products on the shelf that contain these harmful chemicals, and they don't have to tell us. And what we don't know can hurt us. Most people don't quite realize that chemicals that are used in the products that you buy, that you take into your home, are not really regulated by the federal government. I think most people think there is something like the FDA model for drugs for the chemicals that are in uh, consumer products. But that's basically not true, and that that's by design. When I go shopping in a store, I assume that if the product's on the shelf, someone's made sure that it's safe. That if a product was dangerous, toxic, carcinogenic, wouldn't be allowed to be sold. And that's a fundamentally inaccurate assumption. No one's made sure that it's safe. thinking that all the products in our homes are safe. <laughs> but how many of these invisible molecules that we put in our mouths, breathe in, or rub on our skin are harmful? I'm trying to do the right thing for my kids. But because companies are hiding what's in their products, I can't. Come on, you little rascal. Turn your light off. Even though my daughters are healthy now, there's no way of pinpointing what factors are behind any adverse health outcomes in the future. It's dark in here. All right, so time for bed. Lights out. I love you. My wife Heather seemed perfectly healthy. And then she wasn't. After Heather died, the girls and I loaded up the van and hit the open road. 
It was the quintessential American experience. But more than that, the road trip helped us through our grief and into the next chapter as a family. One without mom. It was in Minnesota, visiting the Mall of the Americas, that we discovered Justice, the store. And the girls loved it. I wonder what would have happened if I had picked up a product at Justice and saw a label that disclosed all the chemicals contained inside. It just led in here. I wouldn't have bought it. Would you? Maybe. But at the very least, we would have had the choice. The current system right now, chemicals are not tested in the lab to ensure they're safe. They are tested on all of us. That We are all exposed to mixtures of chemicals, some of which are known to be toxic, some of which have just not been evaluated for their health and safety. It's not okay to expose people to toxic chemicals uh, and ask questions later. Now I know they are testing their products on us. But we aren't volunteers. We are guinea pigs. Yes, we are guinea pigs, and we pay a very high price for being guinea pigs, but the retailer isn't responsible, the business that makes the product isn't responsible, it's you, the consumer, that have to take responsibility for your own health. Clothing for a thousand. Brothers is the brother store of this clothing store for tween girls, whose name means equitableness. Aren. What is justice? Justice, yes. A consumer warning this morning about some children's jewelry. About 137,000 pieces have been recalled for high levels of the toxic metal cadmium. The jewelry is sold at Justice stores. It involves 19 different... I've been trying to get a hold of Michael Radin, the CEO of Justice, since Christmas. I have a log of every phone call and message. I even FedEx them a letter that ask why he sells products that contain carcinogens and hormone-disrupting chemicals to tween girls. He never responded to me. When I found out that Michael Radin would be in New York to host the Justice shareholder meeting, I couldn't resist. After all, I owned exactly one share. Uh, good morning, John Way on Net Return Investments. My investment thesis for Asana was very simple. I brought my two daughters into a Justice store and within 30 seconds, I dropped about $300. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Can we get you to commit to take all the toxic chemicals out of kids' products? We, we don't really believe we have any. Well, you have cadmium. You paid a fine for we that. We don't have any cadmium beyond. Ours are the highest standards in the industry. Okay. Well, you, have, you have phthalates. You have antimony. You have trisfluoroethyl, which well, was banned in the 70s. To be honest, I'm not, a, I'm not a chemist. But I bought one pair of pajamas. Your company wouldn't tell me what was in them, so I had to send it to a lab because you're not very transparent. And what did they find but a chemical that was banned in the 70s? Mm -hmm. I don't think that we, on all the products we sell, actually do a chemical analysis of every single one of them. Don't you think you should? No, I, I don't. You're selling to a seven-year-old girl. What if you're putting hormone? Horm I, I can't solve your issue at the moment. If you you want could to talk solve it about. because you could do the right thing and you could disclose all the ingredients that are in the well, product. We, we think we're doing the right thing. But you're not disclosing all the chemicals. And who is? It's not just corporations that don't want us to know what chemicals are hidden in our products. Thank you for joining us during our beauty report here at HSN. I'm so glad you're tuning in, especially if you're a woman. This is a very, very important segment that we want to share with you. Ambassador Nancy G. Brinker is joining us. She is the founder and CEO of the Susan G. Komen Foundation. Hi. And you are Susan's sister. Hi. Susan G. Komen for The Cure, the largest breast cancer foundation in the world, commissioned a perfume, and it's called Promise Me. And you'd always imagine what pink would smell like. This is what pink, the color, would smell like. Komen didn't get into the specifics of the chemical formulation of their perfume. They really focused on how much money was being raised by their perfume. What's so nice about this is it's, sometimes it's hard to find something to give to mm -hmm. a breast cancer patient. They expect about a million dollars would be raised by selling Promise Me. 
me. This is $59 and sold out on hsn.com. And we did find there were a number of chemicals of concern, galaxolide and oxybenzone, as well as toluene, which is one of the toxic trio. For those of you, you know, that might be suffering right now with chemo or radiation. Chemicals that are toxic and hazardous, chemicals which haven't been adequately tested for human safety, and chemicals which, you know, are suspected to increase a woman's risk of breast cancer. You're part of the promise now with this limited edition collection that's at a huge value. In essence, what they were saying is that the ends justified the means, that a million dollars raised for breast cancer justified selling this perfume. These companies can make their products more cheaply if they use more toxic ingredients and they don't have to disclose those ingredients. But I, as the consumer, have to pay the price of being exposed to those toxic chemicals. There's a direct connection between the lack of transparency, the economics and the profits of many of these companies, and the costs that get shifted to us as consumers. The chemical industry is a growing one, growing by leaps and bounds. Since World War II, we've seen an uptick in chemicals in our everyday consumer products. You know, this whole better living through chemistry that happened in the 1950s. Everything in the world, you know, is made up of molecules. And some of the most useful are those that form versatile plastics, like Alethon, Delrin, Lucite, Teflon. Here's what we need. Oh, my. Molecules. There are plastics in your toaster. In the blender and the clock. But what happened is these chemicals were coming on the market and they were not regulated at all. On the door and in the lock. Through better living through chemistry, the benefits are largely ease of living. But the debate here is about untoward health consequences of uncontrolled exposure to chemicals that were never really regulated, I think, properly in the first place. The chemical industry was largely self-regulating until the 1960s, when Rachel Carson's landmark book, Silent Spring, alerted the public to the growing danger of toxic substances. And the modern environmental movement was born. The Environmental Protection Agency, number one interest besides... Among students? Yes. Under besides. pressure from growing environmental groups, President Richard M. Nixon established the Environmental Protection Agency and reigning in chemical manufacturers was a top priority. We often do not discover how harmful a compound can be until it has become a commonplace item in our everyday life. EPA leaders like Russell E. Train sought fair but firm toxic chemical regulation. And again and again, we find ourselves engaged in an extremely difficult and drawn out struggle to protect the public from a hazard to which it has already been exposed while at the same time trying to avoid putting people out of work uh, or out of business. The result was sweeping legislation intended to protect people from exposure to toxic chemicals. President Ford has signed into law the Toxic Substances Control Act, long sought by environmentalists, for giving the Environmental Protection Agency the central authority to have chemicals tested before they're put on the marketplace. In theory, Tosca was a hard-won victory for American consumers. In reality, the chemical industry was the real winner. The Toxic Substances Control Act is a law that was supposed to regulate chemicals, but Tosca really never got off the ground. And Tosca grandfathered in a set of chemicals that it made it very hard to regulate. So that means at least it's legal to use in this country over 80,000 chemicals. How do you begin to sift through those to identify the ones that are, are problematic and, uh, uh, and restrict them? Tosca also secretly put consumers in harm's way by limiting the ability of the Environmental Protection Agency to do its job. The law has not given EPA the authority it needs to identify chemicals that may be problematic. And secondly, even where we do get information that indicates a chemical is of high concern, EPA lacks the authority to, authority to regulate that chemical. To make matters worse, Tosca offers the chemical industry and product manufacturers that use the chemicals Another important perk, secrecy. One of the major problems with the current system is the secrecy about 
chemicals. So it's not just that they're not being regulated, but in many cases, their identity, the identity of the chemical is secret. And that's not very usable information for most people. Who is that? Yeah, this is how I can see you. In the mirror. Although Heather was diligent about reading labels as a precaution to protect our girls, Americans can't avoid chemicals that aren't listed on the label. The truth is, the EPA estimates that there are 17,000 secret chemicals in commerce today. And this secrecy is taking its toll. I think the book is called, it's the bearish thing there, it's called the, the, the trouble with secrets. What's the opposite of secrets? Not secrets. <laughs> and what's another, what's a word that means not secrets? Truth. That's right. Which would you rather have? Someone tell the truth or tell the secrets? Truth. Truth. Me too. One of the problems with the current system is uh, we used to be the best for health and safety issues. But when it's come to product safety, we're now not really anymore. Europe is. And um, my favorite example of this is the Katrina trailers. After Katrina, you had all these people housed in these trailers that FEMA bought. And the trailers had plywood and press board that was made in China, and it off-gassed formaldehyde at levels that were very dangerous. This Chinese factory made one set of wood that was low formaldehyde for the European market, and actually for Chinese markets, because the Chinese regulations were tougher than ours, and they made the dirtier one for the American market. And this is leading to this perverse scenario where we're beginning to exhibit the signs of the third world country, where we're the dumping ground for the products that the rest of the world um, is increasingly saying, actually, we don't want those. The European Union banned 1,100 uh, carcinogens and reproductive toxins from their products. Um, they've taken a much more progressive stance on, on chemical regulation in the EU than we have in this country. We have U.S. companies that provide disclosure in Europe or safer formulas in Europe, but continue to not provide disclosure and provide less safe formulas in the U.S. They're gonna to have to sell that product somewhere, so they're going to start to sell that here. So we're going to be the chemical dumping ground. Made in America should be um, a positive thing and not a warning label. The chemical used to manufacture many of the products that we use every day, cosmetics, personal care, cleaning agents, are actually never tested to find out if they're harmful. Isn't that correct? The industry conducts an extensive evaluation of their products, but right. the FDA does not get to see any of that information. Doesn't that cast amazing doubt on the ability of the regulatory system to actually protect the public? Senator, at, at FDA, all of our products that we approve are based on data and studies by that particular manufacturer. But doesn't that bother you? That's my point. You don't seem to see the connection here. Senator, as studies become available to us, we at FDA apply the Studies from whom become available? Whoever, if they've been published. Now, the only studies you're getting right now, have you asked for studies from independent sources? We don't normally ask for independent sources. Then you don't protect the American people if you don't ask for them, if you don't look beyond what's handed to you. So it's not a safety system. It's a marketing system that's in place to try to assure the American public that everything's handled and you don't have to worry about this. So we can keep doing business as usual. And unfortunately, business as usual is continuing to use the same toxic chemical formulas that they've been using forever. Brandon, Brandon, you gotta get off the school. Okay. It's going to be a great day. Even though his allergy to Axe body spray has fundamentally changed his life, Please Brandon Silk is determined to go back to school. This is Mr. LaPorta, principal of Freedom High School. We welcome back to school Brandon Silk. As you may remember, Brandon has an extreme and life-threatening allergy to Axe body spray. Once again, I am asking all of our Freedom family to please refrain from using Axe body spray while attending school. Like right here I have to hit, because that's where she hit me every time. Okay. So, let me see you do it for five seconds. Please. Fine. Okay. 
where's that one going? This is going to the nurse. Okay, I'm ready. I just want to talk about if you remember all the protocols for today. I know my emergency routes. Okay, you have your phone. I have my phone. I'll text you if I feel anything going wrong. Okay. I'll text you and go right to the nurse. Only if, worry if the nurse calls you, okay? Okay. Freedom High officials have designed a battle plan to help Brandon avoid a potential gauntlet of axe-stinking teenagers. Well, this is my first day. Brandon? Come on, there's kids. Ow! Get off. But no matter how careful he is, he could end up back in the hospital. Or worse. God, just cut him a break, please. Pinpointing an ingredient that's not listed, I mean, it, that's where the frustrating part is. Are they hiding something? I don't know, you know? I mean, it, I think it makes it wor look worse for them, for them not disclosing the fragrance ingredients, because to me, it's like, what are you hiding? You know, what could be in the makeup of the fragrance? It's proprietary, please. I mean, come on. It's not just the mixture of fragrance ingredients that are hidden in Axe. It also contains chemicals like 1,4-Dioxane, a chemical the EPA classifies as a probable human carcinogen. So I started thinking about my kids at school. What are the long-term effects of hundreds of students spraying Axe and the sense off-gas is recycled through the school's heating and cooling system all day, every day, along with a ton of other chemicals? I feel that he is a canary in a coal mine. I don't know what the future brings, and I don't want anything bad to happen to him, you know? I don't want his future to be filled with question marks. In spite of Rosa's, and Freedom High School's best efforts to discourage his classmates from wearing Axe, Brandon's first day didn't go as planned. So I had a meeting with my principal, and on the way in, I smelt a kid wearing Axe, and instantly I started to feel my throat start to close, and I had to get stuck with the EpiPen and be rushed to the hospital. We have a, a health epidemic, whether it's allergies or asthma or cancer, and people are starting to wonder why. What is the connection between the products we use, the chemicals in our environment, and our own health? Thank you for going, Ty. Hi, I read an article online yesterday, and it said something that it has a chemical in it called 1,4-Dioxane that might cause cancer. I just wanted to make sure that is not true. It's not something that we add to the product, okay? It's something that's in the product. And it... Who, could you tell me um, who adds it then? Pardon me? Uh, you said you didn't add it. I was wondering who does add it. Um, it's in all of the ingredients. You know what I mean? No, I don't. Okay, how can I say this? You know, if you do 1,200 loads of okay. wash a day, it's still at the safe level, but okay. everything causes cancer nowadays, you know what I mean? Right. I'm just trying to avoid the, those things that do cause cancer. Does the FDA have the authority to ensure that products like bubble bath or baby lotion is free from toxic chemicals like formaldehyde before they hit the shelves. Um, there is no pre-market approval requirement. If the FDA believed that the level of formaldehyde was harmful, could it require a recall of that product from market shelves? It, it could not under current law. Uh, if a company decided to include arsenic as a component of a face cream, would they even have to notify the FDA first? Uh, it would not. If the arsenic was used as a component of a fragrance, uh, would the company be required to list arsenic on the product label? As a component of a fragrance, it would not. That would come, I think, as a shock to most people because everyone assumes that they can turn the box around and see what's in it. But uh, the FDA does not have the authority uh, to uh, require that to be disclosed to the public. Uh, and I think therein lies the problem. With so little regulation and free reign to use whatever ingredients I wanted in a product, I thought I'd make my own signature scent. Its top notes open with a burst of carcinogens. Its middle notes are a hormone-disrupting mixture of phthalates. 
but my secret sauce really makes this scent pop. It's perfectly legal to use all these ingredients, and consumers will never know. They'll just see the word fragrance on the label. The FDA guidelines haven't changed since they were enacted in 1938. In fact, the FDA only recommends that manufacturers fill out a voluntary application to register the scent with the agency. Listing fragrance ingredients is also optional. But the truth is, few if any manufacturers volunteer this information. Because if anything bad happened to someone using a product, the consumer would have to prove that that product was the culprit. Until then, we manufacturers are all innocent until proven guilty. As crazy as this seems, it's not just consumer products that use trade secrets to hide toxic chemicals. Hydraulic fracturing, or fracking, is a process to extract natural gas from underground rock. Fracking depends on billions of gallons of water, infused with a toxic stew of chemicals to release the trapped gas. Like fragrance, manufacturers of fracking mixtures claim the ingredients as a trade secret. But what's troubling is that fracking fluids and fragrance share many of the same toxic chemical ingredients. The truth is, it would be completely legal to bottle fracking fluid and sell it as a fragrance. And fracking companies could pump fragrance down a well to extract shale gas from the ground. Who knows? Celebrity fracking fluid may be the next frontier in product endorsements. Awesome. Thank you. Picture? Sure. The chemical industry has gotten away with producing billions of tons of chemicals without doing safety studies, putting them out into the environment, putting them into products that are all around our homes. And it's up to essentially the consumers or the government to prove that these substances are dangerous. So basically we're living in a toxic soup and it's a giant experiment on human health. You know, the challenge is it's very hard to definitively prove that specific chemicals have caused specific diseases. And this is not unique to breast cancer. So even in the absence of watertight, cause and effect, incontroversial human data, there's enough data to indicate that these are serious chemicals of concern. We believe it is imperative that we really follow a precautionary principle. The precautionary principle is the idea that we wear our seatbelts, even though we don't know if we're going to get in a car crash that day. And why do we do that? Because taking the action is easy, and the consequences could be very severe if we fail to take the action. But with toxic chemicals, we keep being exposed until we're certain that it might cause harm. That means waiting for data, and those data are body bags. They're sick people, they're dying people, they're people that have birth defects or learning disabilities. That's not science that we want to be waiting for while we continue to be exposed to toxic chemicals. Most industrialized nations use the precautionary principle to protect its citizens from toxic chemical exposures. Even many developing nations follow a precautionary approach. Egypt upheaval, President Mohamed Morsi ousted in a military coup. In fact, shortly before being overthrown, Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi enacted a ban on some endocrine disrupting chemicals. But here in the United States, our federal system takes a different approach to chemical regulation. Members of the Senate reject the precautionary principle. In the case of chemicals, we use a very perverse framework. You're innocent until you're proven guilty. The question is, okay, well, how many people have to die? How many people have to get sick before the proof becomes overwhelming and inescapable? 42. And what we need is a preventative approach. You have to prove the product safe. You have to prove the chemical safe. And until that's proven, it shouldn't be allowed in a store. It shouldn't be allowed in a product. But we don't have that framework, and that's the framework we need. Because the federal government fails to protect Americans under the Toxic Substances Control Act, state governments have been forced to pass laws to protect its citizens from toxic chemical exposures. 
This trend began in the mid-1980s, when the consumers in California faced off against the chemical industry in a showdown over toxic chemicals. The result was a tough new disclosure law called Proposition 65, or Prop 65. Prop 65 prohibits businesses from knowingly exposing consumers to chemicals known to cause cancer or birth defects. They have to either reformulate the product to um, use less toxic ingredients, or remove the product completely from the market, or they have to put a label on the product. Coke and Pepsi saying they'll change their recipes because of a chemical that could cause cancer. Yeah, so Coke and Pepsi announced that they're gonna change the formulation of the, of the caramel coloring that they use in their sodas to avoid putting a cancer warning label. A consumer group found a chemical in there that has been linked to, to cancer in animals. Is That's the good thing about Prop 65, right? It puts you know, the burden and the onus on the manufacturer. So as soon as Coca-Cola has to put Put a cancer warning on their main beverage, you know, their, their Coke, then they're going to reformulate the product. Coke says that there has never been a problem in terms of cancer from this caramel coloring, but they want to make the change to avoid that, that warning label. The idea with Prop 65 was that the state of California, once they've identified that something causes cancer or birth defects, you're required to warn people before you expose them to it. And it has had an impact if you have to put that warning on a consumer product and there's another product that doesn't have the warning, that actually has an impact. I think if companies had to list what's in the products, it would change the industry because once consumers know what's in the bottle, they start changing what they buy. Suddenly, manufacturers imagined a doomsday scenario where consumers actually knew what chemicals were in their everyday products. Shampoo, conditioner, deodorant, toothpaste, moisturizer, hand sanitizer. Like you pick up a product and you don't really even think about that you're using yet another product. And each one of those products has 15 or 20 synthetic chemicals. Your body burden's enormous. You know, you're just dumping all this toxic stuff into your bloodstream. We find known human carcinogens, chemicals that cause reproductive harm, hormone disruptors. Are they safe? Absolutely not. They say it's just low levels of any given toxic chemical, just a little bit of carcinogen in the baby shampoo, a little bit of lead in the lipstick. But those low levels are adding up every single day. But instead of reformulating to make safer products that could cost a little more, the industry opened up a new front on the war on cancer. But this wasn't a fight to get carcinogens out of products. It was a fight to keep them in. The industry foot soldiers in this well-financed campaign come from organizations called trade associations. These trade associations represent corporations intent on repelling any chemical regulation. The biggest problem with Washington is just the special interest money that corrupts the process. And it's most embodied in the American Chemistry Council, the Trade Association, which almost acts like a, a, a political party, a fierce little, you know, a, a communist cell or something. The American Chemistry Council, or ACC, is one of the most powerful trade associations anywhere. The ACC spends hundreds of millions of dollars to influence public opinion, fund political campaigns, and underwrite aggressive lobbying efforts, all to avoid regulation that would impact the profits of the largest chemical companies in the world. These companies, you know, have it down. They're gonna do whatever it takes to feed their bottom line. And of course they're gonna lobby against every, any kind of legislation that's gonna legislate that they have to stop. They don't want to. The trade organization has become the representative to say things that the companies I don't think would dare to say because a lot of times it's untrue um, and it misrepresents the harms of chemicals and it hides important information from government regulators as well as the public about how to protect themselves from these chemicals. When I heard there was a hearing in my own state about banning carcinogenic flame retardant chemicals in children's products, I was curious if lobbyists would show up to block legislation intended to protect kids. The American Chemistry Council, they deploy people to all kinds of state capitals, and sometimes they hire local lobbyists uh, whose job it is to try and push back on this stuff. They are in every state house, in every hall of Congress we go to. They are there, they have a lot of money, they're pouring a lot of this money into making sure that they are never regulated. And when we do pass laws, they are there the next year trying to get that law off the books. Testifying on behalf of consumers were world-renowned scientists, pediatricians, even firefighters. And then there was Steve Rosario, a lobbyist from the American Chemistry Council. What 
type of evidence would be compelling enough to the American Chemistry Council to uh, prohibit the use of a particular chemical? Not being technical, I can't answer that question, but Again, don't, don't be technical. If there are peer-reviewed scientific studies, if there's testimony from the medical community and others saying this stuff is toxic, it's hazardous, especially to kids, is that a reasonable standard? If the information is sufficient to show actual causal harm, we believe that whenever you ban a chemical or product, that is a very drastic um, proposal. Why is that drastic? It is drastic because you are impacting way, way more than the health concerns that are being alleged against a particular product or chemical without sufficient science. You think the standard for government to ban carcinogenic substances, endocrine disruptors that people are being exposed to, that we know where people are being exposed to from products that your industry is putting out there, from consumer products, should be extraordinarily high. But you're, you're not articulating a standard other than to say that it ought to be virtually certain, if not certain, that is actually causing the harm before we ban it. The uh, Toxic Substances Control Act, TOSCA, which I'm sure you're well familiar with. How many chemicals has the federal government banned on TOSCA in the 30-some-odd years that it has existed? I believe the number is five. Five. I would not believe for a single moment that there are five out of 80,000, only five out of 80,000, that are problematic. Chemicals are a part of our everyday life. They're all around us. They're a necessity. But some of them hurt people. Why shouldn't we shift to a standard that says, before you can use it, you have to prove that it's safe? That's the precautionary principle. Exactly. And the issue with the precautionary principle is you would never be able to prove with certainty that anything is perfectly safe. And that's why we think that our system is actually better than the precautionary principle. Lobbyists like Steve Rosario are paid to influence the political process. So it shouldn't surprise me that when he's not trying to keep harmful chemicals in kids' products, he's also running for political office. I caught up with Steve at a debate in upstate New York. He had just been endorsed by Planned Parenthood. Mr. Rosario, congratulations yes. on your Planned Parenthood endorsement. Oh, thank you do they, uh, do they know you're a lobbyist for the American Chemistry Council? May I ask who you are? Uh, John Whalen. Nice to meet you. Likewise. But does Planned Parenthood know you're a lobbyist for the American Chemistry Council? Because you probably know that Planned Parenthood lobbies against the ACC at state capitals. So I've, I'm wondering if you disclose that to them. I am very proud of what I do. I have been doing it for 21 years. Are you a lobbyist? I am a senior executive. I have my certificate as a certified executive association manager. Do I advocate? Yes. The American Chemistry Council and other trade associations have something to hide. What do you think about TOSCA reform? You think we should have to prove chemicals are safe before exposing the women and children? Would you be able to answer that question? I will answer no questions from someone I do not know. Business is writing the rules. Government isn't really writing the rules. It's the businesses, the trade associations, the lobbyists that write these rules. And they're not written with us in mind. They're written through one lens. What do we want to do that increases the profitability of our industry and our businesses? When we buy products, a portion of our money fuels a corrupt system, starting at the retailer, to the manufacturer, and into the pockets of trade associations. Trade associations use our money to ghostwrite legislation and hire lobbyists to bring money and industry-friendly bills to Congress that will deny consumers of our right to know what's in the products we buy. And guess who's paying for it? But there are politicians who do care that Americans are being harmed, and they're pushing legislation to protect us. You know, after a tough day of legislating on the floor of the House of Representatives, I'd like to come back to my office and clean up a little bit. That's why I've introduced H.R. 3057, the Household Products Labeling Act. 
My bill is very simple and it's just a matter of common sense and it's based on this simple model. People know, you know, you buy cigarettes, there's a skull and crossbones. They know you buy a certain food, it tells you trans fats. But what they don't know is the cleaning product that they just used to scrub the floor that their baby is now crawling on and ingesting uh, may be just as dangerous. The fundamental problem is that nobody knows what the chemicals are. Uh, and uh, I think they have a right to know. All we're saying is inform them and then let them make whatever decisions they want. Another bill would prohibit the personal care industry from using chemicals that are banned in other countries. How many chemical ingredients have been banned for use in cosmetics in the United States? I think it, the number is about a dozen. Actually, I believe it's 10. And, and how many chemical ingredients have been banned for use in cosmetics in the European Union? I don't know. That's over 1,200. The Safe Cosmetics Act would require that ingredients that are found to be carcinogenic or uh, interfere with development or cause reproductive harm would be phased out of products, that there be a list of ingredients, including the uh, components of what are called fragrances. But no matter how reasonable the regulation or balance the bill, representatives like Leonard Lance from New Jersey must make sure they never make it in the law. These products are among the safest regulated by the FDA, and the agency has strong authority to regulate cosmetics. For over a decade, Leonard Lance has championed the cause of the chemical industry out of necessity. We're off to find the elusive Congressman Leonard Lance of New Jersey. Within the boundaries of Lance's home turf are the headquarters of chemical giant BASF, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, L'Oreal, Revlon, and it's home to some of the largest fragrance and flavor companies in the world. In the case of cosmetics, Lance introduced opposing legislation. There's some speculation that the Personal Care Product Council, the trade association, wrote the bill, and Mr. Lance is, is simply the face of it. Lance's bill doesn't prohibit carcinogens in the EDCs. It prohibits states from passing laws that would protect consumers using a legal concept called preemption. The Lance bill would preempt any state regulation, which I think is um, a very bad idea, particularly given the fact that states like California have much stronger protections for consumers and to preclude legislation that may be passed in the, in the future from going into effect. That's its idea, really. Simply put, a weak federal law would replace strong state laws. Congressman Lance, why did you introduce the Cosmetic Safety Amendments Act? I think it would be really a very dangerous piece of legislation that would leave consumers very vulnerable. Good morning, Congressman Lance. What if you have a time to talk about the Cosmetic Safety Act? Uh, the Cosmetic Safety Act? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, certainly, yeah. Well, I just want to know why you introduced the bill. Um, because I want to make sure that uh, uh, we have appropriate regulation. Do you think that consumers have a right to know if there's a carcinogen in a personal care product? Uh, yes, I do. But under your bill, they would be able to put ingredients in there and not have to disclose they're in there. I, I want to make sure that everything is appropriately uh, identified, and I want to work with all of those who are interested in this issue. What about the fragrance loophole that allowed people to put styrene or formaldehyde and not have to disclose uh, well, that? I, I, I'm certainly willing to discuss uh, ways to uh, make sure that uh, your views are, are concerned. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And what is your name? My name is John Whalen. Uh-huh. Where are you from, John? Uh, New York. What, what do, you, do you think that companies should have to prove ingredients are safe before they expose them to women and children? Uh, I certainly think that we should have a reg regime that protects the American people. Would you be able to answer that question? I, I, I want to make sure the public is completely protected. What was your inspiration to author the uh, Cosmetic Safety Amendment Act? I want to work with all of those involved to make sure that uh, the American people are completely protected. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. The biggest reason why the chemical industry fights um, transparent and public knowledge about the hazards of its chemicals is because of liability claims. It doesn't want to pay for harm. I think of my life with Heather all the time.
I remember one morning, while Heather was going through chemotherapy, I saw her planting tulip bulbs in a neglected sidewalk flower bed outside my office window. That's what she always did. She left things better than she found them. Heather wanted the girls to remember her in an enchanted place, surrounded by color and light. So we transformed an empty studio apartment into her pink and periwinkle sanctuary, full of life, love, and hope. But we didn't get to enjoy it long enough. Heather died here six days later. We were all by her side. The chemical industry told us that lead was safe, asbestos was safe, tobacco was safe, and now it's telling us that the chemicals in our everyday products are safe. But if these chemicals are safe, then why is industry so afraid of disclosing them? We have in America just a broken system. And I think that it will have long-term negative consequences for us as a nation. I, I think that the lack of regulation, the lack of responsibility, will make us a less competitive and successful country. The Toxic Substances Control Act, the 1976 law that was supposed to keep us safe from toxic chemicals, may be doing the exact opposite. But because most Americans have never heard of Tosca, they don't realize how important it is to fix it. More and more, there's peer-reviewed articles in mainstream publications linking chemicals that are common in the economy, in your home, with health effects, health problems that are also increasing in the population. That's the major theme. Now, public health officials have brought the fight to reform Tosca to Washington. Chemicals are contributing to the burden of disease in this country, the diseases that affect millions of American families, and Tosca reform is fundamentally a solemn exercise in trying to make progress in preventing that. EPA cannot tell us with any accuracy how many chemicals are actually in commerce today. And chemicals that we were told we would never be exposed to are now routinely being found in the dust in our homes, in our environment, and even in the bodies of people living in the most remote parts of the globe. Do you agree that chemical manufacturers should have to prove through unbiased studies that their products are safe for pregnant women, for infants, and for children before they can sell those chemicals in the U.S. If someone can't answer that question with an affirmative response, then they are putting the special interests before the health of the people. But consumers are no match for the American Chemistry Council's secret weapon. If you think that this is somehow going to create jobs in the United States, uh, I beg you to come and visit uh, the industry and under understand how it works. Congressman Cal Dooley, a seven-term representative from California, proved himself a reliable soldier for industry. Well, thank you, Simon, and I'm once again trying to do the right thing. Marshalling bills that benefited companies like Monsanto, Conagra, and the meat industry. Genetically enhanced products are, in fact, uh, been determined to be safe. And being industry-friendly in Congress really paid off for Cal. I really have the honor of representing over 350 food, beverage, and consumer products companies. First, as the CEO of the Grocery Manufacturers Association, Congressman Cal became Calorie Cal, and his salary was supersized. Then Calorie Cal got promoted. Committee, I'm Cal Dooley. I'm president and CEO of the American Chemistry Council. Calorie Cal was now Chemical Cal. We have a chlorine tree here. Chlorine's in this water. You know, chlorine's in the varnish that's on your desk. Chlorine's in the semiconductors that are in your phone. And because every product is chemicals, Cal doesn't just lobby for the trillion dollar chemical industry. He indirectly lobbies for every industry, even fracking. Uh, you know, we use natural gas as a feedstock. Uh, it's kind of like what flour is to a bakery. And so the chemical industry takes natural gas and it makes plastics, composites, it makes food packaging materials, it makes textiles. It goes into literally thousands of different products. When I was a kid, my father told me that people have two jobs. The first job is the one they tell their family about at the dinner table. And the second job is the one they actually do during the day. They want to be seen 
as being progressive and being concerned for safety, but really they are fighting independent scientific reviews of these chemicals. They are against the recommendations of the National Academy of Sciences, and they fight anything, fight anything that would ever lead to regulating a chemical as they push even rollbacks of the few existing things that are being done that could ever lead to regulating a chemical. There's just a hypocrisy machine that, they, uh, that they've really put in place. Even though the American Chemistry Council declined my interview request, I still wanted to witness a $3 million lobbyist in action. Um, are you advocating for our body burden of chemicals to go up over time? That's okay. just a yes or no question, Cal, and then you... Well, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a no, but it is, you know, I, I'll be honest, I take offense when anyone would even insinuate that our industry, you know, is supporting uh, an increase in the body burden of chemicals over a period of time. Well, that, that's where we're headed right now. Where, where do you think we're headed? And that's what we are advocating for the modernization of Tosca. You say in your statement that the current law needs to be reformed. If the industry truly believes that, then you need to come forward with what you believe is necessary. This bill with this safety standard is a prescription to deny the U.S. manufacturer's ability to be at the forefront of innovation and creating jobs. And in terms of the safety standard that you have proposed here that we the objected to, we this. have an alternative. As I listened to Cal's political doublespeak, I couldn't help thinking about my wife, our kids, and the 350 million Americans who are exposed to toxic chemicals every day. If your objective is to defeat legislation, if that's your objective, then I understand what you're doing. But if your objective is to get legislation enacted, I don't understand what you're doing. But it's a bit of the fundamental disagreement on the direction to go. My father also told me that when dealing with bullies, go after the biggest one. I couldn't resist. Hey, Cal, how you doing? John Whalen, nice to meet you. Hey, do you think that Americans should know if there's a carcinogen or endocrine disrupting chemical in their products? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's where we have our regulatory agencies and EPA and FDA that are working uh, with all stakeholders to get that type of information. So you think it should be disclosed on the label, carcinogens and endocrine disruptors? We think that they, every uh, consumer product should comply with regulations that are created by EPA But under current law, that's not part of the regulations. Do you think they should disclose a carcinogen or endocrine disruptor on the label? Uh, we have EPA and FDA and industry as well as consumers should rely on those regulatory agencies uh, to make those determinations. Right. and what's the appropriate information that should be uh, disclosed. Right. What do you think some of the main uh, benefits for consumers of undisclosed carcinogens and endocrine disrupting chemicals? Well, it's not, you know, it, the issue is complex. It's got to be dealt with on a science basis. You know, if a, if a product doesn't have an exposure of any type of chemical that might pose a health concern, which is being determined by FDA and EPA, uh, then it shouldn't be required to be labeled, which is what Congress and policymakers have determined. So you think that, that, you think that a parent has a right to know if there's a carcinogen in a product they're buying for a baby? The, uh, you know, the hearing that we're having today is basically trying to modernize and reform the law so the regulatory agencies are doing a better job. But that doesn't force the disclosure of carcinogens. People might want to know if there's a carcinogen in a product. And that's where, you know, where Congress has that authority. To well, what do you, what do you think chemical. personally? Do you think you, would you want to know if there's a carcinogen in a product you're buying? I, you know, I, we want to have the appropriate information that is disclosed that poses you know, unreasonable risk to health and human health and environment. I like to separate the safety and the transparency issue. People have a right to know if your risk can be subjective. But whether you're transparent, that's binary. You're either disclosing it or you're not. Why wouldn't you want people to know there's a carcinogen in the product you're buying? We have to place a great deal of confidence uh, with our regulatory agencies, the Food and Drug Administration. But if they, how can we trust them if they don't even have the information? Oh, they, the FDA is not legally obligated to ask a company who regulates for a list of chemicals in their own products. Uh, FDA has information on every chemical that is in a consumer product. No, they don't. Sure they do. They do not. Yeah. What about the fragrance loophole? No, I'm not. I don't represent them. Well, they say it's a trade secret, so they don't have to disclose carcinogens and EDCs. No, no, but even on a trade secret, they have the information. Well, can we have a sit-down meeting and talk about the disclosure issue? Yeah, well, if you can work with my yeah, staff. Yeah. Sure, great. The Thanks, Cal. You bet. Industry wants to have it both ways. They don't want to prove chemicals are safe, and they don't want to disclose their ingredients. If they did, then consumers would see through the pretty packaging and learn the ugly truth about what's inside.
I think we still do have somewhat of a mindset that if this were a big problem, we would be seeing lots of people dying, to put it bluntly. In fact, the science is telling us that's a naive assumption. Chemical exposures and other environmental factors can result in changes that do dramatically affect our health in ways that are serious and don't kill you, but they certainly affect your quality of life for the entirety of your life. Today, we need to be sensitive to the chronic effects of chemicals, not just their acute effects. Well, if someone made a movie about you, what would you want them to know? Everything. Such as what? And how awesome her is. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> We will never know exactly what caused Heather's breast cancer. And maybe it doesn't matter. But we can't rule out exposure to toxic chemicals. And when I look at our daughters, why wouldn't I do everything I could to reduce their chances of suffering from cancer or any other disease? On the first anniversary of Heather's death, the girls wanted to send her a message, and they thought balloons would be the best way to reach her. Today, even though Heather's gone, the flowers she planted always come back. The most important thing I learned on this journey is that just because a product is on the shelf doesn't mean that it's safe. Consumers will have safer options if two things happen. One, companies disclose all ingredients in their products. And two, Congress fixes the Toxic Substances Control Act so regulators can get the chemicals of greatest concern off the market. But as long as the chemical industry resist calls to prove chemicals are safe, Americans' body burden of chemicals will escalate. We must act now. Our system to regulate chemicals stinks. We know that chemicals are contributing to the cancer incidence in this country, to the incidence of learning disabilities, to the incidence of infertility. And if you could restrict the chemicals that contribute to it, you're taking a hunk out of the suffering of chronic disease in this country you're taking some amount of it down, and that's a worthy goal. If we actively screened these chemicals for their potential health effects, we could do so much right away. We're talking probably about one to two percent of all chemicals in wide commerce that are of greatest concern. I think for some families, the wake-up point is when someone becomes sick, and it's why it really takes a holistic approach where we're making different personal choices, Companies are doing a better job, and we're getting better policies in place. It's just amazing how much difference we can make by not taking this stuff in our own homes. And it's great common sense to exercise precaution. I mean, how can you not? Once you learn this, you can't unlearn it. I believe this is a fight that we're going to win. It's the direction that many companies are already going. I think to get people to wake up is getting out as much information as we can. And as long as we can hit critical mass, then change happens. When I look back at the time I shared with Heather and what I learned from her, I know I can't hit the reset button, but I can follow her lead and do the best job possible to raise our girls to be aware, loving, and strong, just like their mom. Thank you for calling aeropostel.com. How may I help you today? I have a product question. Okay. I'm looking at the kids' polka dot flea sleep pants. I was wondering if you use flame retardant chemicals on them, and if you do, which ones? Okay, all I'm seeing here is relaxed fit, flame resistant. It doesn't say anything about any type of chemicals. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Not really. 
I don't think that's something someone would normally put on their website. Is there any other way I could find it out? Well, let me see here. Um, can you hold, please, while I try to find out that information? Sure. And now I'm on hold.